All right, we're set up to trim today. We're doing this front part of the hallway and the bathroom ceiling. We are not doing, uh, this is where dividing these is gonna save me. This is gonna be where the wall is. And I don't have to do this area of ceiling, which is, which is cool. I've got a piece here that's got a very different aspect ratio, short ends, long sides, and I have kind of a square room. So how I strategize uh, the use of this trim is gonna be kind of important. I got a pile of two inch cove and three inch cove from a friend that bought a house from a finished carpenter. And I got it for free and it came with this antique white that's almost, this is how it was and this is our trim color basically. So it's real close, I'm not gonna pre-paint it. However, I would recommend that people do because when you lay crown mold down on its back like this, uh, you can paint easily all the sides of it with a clean, crisp brush follow through right off the end. Get some a couple great layers on there, coats, and just brush it out so smooth and perfect and beautiful and let it dry. And then when it goes up, you need a very little um, hole filling and touch up. You don't want to crank your neck around and paint the bottom, face, and front of a of crown all the way around the room. It's a complete end cut both sides to the ceiling, you know, cut to the ceiling and cut to the wall. It's a complete nightmare if the chrome, or if the trim isn't up already, uh, paint it first, for sure. Um, so we're gonna work with this. I just cleaned it and we're gonna call it painted. And if I need to touch it up, I need to touch it up with a paint match or whatever. What? Um, we're gonna flat cut ends and cope uh, pieces in between rather than put miters on it. So I'm not gonna go exhaustively into how to cope but uh, you're gonna pick walls to flat cut the ends on, and then the adjacent wall will get a piece with a flat cut end on it, and then I'll coat both ends of the piece that jumps between them, and as soon as I remember where I set that down, bing, here's a cope. And you'll notice that, um, here's how they differ. If you need to cope an end, you need to get a measurement. This thing would just sit here. Just sit there, fella. Right, do it over here. All right, there you go. Ah, you sit there, right? Okay. And kick the thing. All right. Here's a 45 degree. The saw isn't set up for this one right now, but it's set the other way. But you put a 45 degree, you get a measurement from one piece of existing trim flat end cut to the other piece of existing trim flat end cut and you put a back angle 45 on both of them and then as you look at it where the top face disappears out of sight right there and you square up to the end of it you can see the face of the cut and you just have to make it so the face of the cut is gone to look at it from that way this has been coped that's what that is so it's nice that it's pre-painted this is a great uh, way to use that to your advantage as well. You're just going to remove the wood as you look at it this way until you get down to that surface, that edge, the contrast where it changes there and create a cope. And what you get with that is anywhere along the line here he fits at 90 degrees and he fits tight. And that's just exactly what you want. Once you get down to a point where the wood where the... Uh, just stand once you get down to this point, I like to put a little back angle on it too, so I increase the angle away from it. So now I have like a knife edge, it would, it'd be, it would be called here. So when you come over and engage at 90 degrees, that's the first thing that lands is that very leading edge, and that's what keeps that joint tight, and that's how you do it with natural finished wood, which is a complete, it's a bear, it's even more difficult than this. If you're gonna start trying to do, this isn't incredibly difficult, I don't wanna shy people away from it. However, if you're gonna putz with it, work with a small profile in a place that isn't, you're not being paid for necessarily. This is my own place, although I'm pretty comfortable with this. And you're using paint grade or it will be painted, so you have the ability to caulk the joint a little bit if necessary. These are things that'll help you um, practice and get better. The other thing is, I'll put the, in a pl in an area like this, the long runs will have flat ends on them and the short runs will have need to be coped. If you make an error or somebody calls you in the middle of it and you cope it in the wrong orientation, whatever the problem you have, you're doing it on the short piece. It's easier to hold when you're grinding instead of having 16 feet running away from you, all of it. And there's three or four in a full length 16 footer or whatever from the, from the factory length. If you make an error, there's a couple more in the piece that you started. If you leave it for one of two long pieces on a run like this and you're going to cope the end and you make an error, that's it. Set it down, use it somewhere else where you need a shorter piece, but you can go drag a whole new fresh one out and try to do it again. And the more you mess up, the more you psych yourself out sometimes. And you could really, I mean, a stick of this is like, I don't even know, painted two inch cove, pre-painted two inch cove, real wood. 
um, $25, $30 maybe at a 16 foot length. So, you know, it adds up. Uh, in a case like this, I put my straight cut ends on that piece because that means my cope for that is going to point away from me here. You'd have to be here to see into the crack if there were one, which there won't be. But the cope goes away from us there, and it'll go away from us there. That's how I picked that wall, which means this wall gets a straight cut, and that gets a cope piece, and on and so forth. And you can alternate it. Some, sometimes one end will have a straight cut, one end will have a cope, depending on when a tom, whatever kind of tomfoolery you have for, for a room. This, that, whatever. However, you want to be sure that uh, the small size that you're using is not symmetrical. You need to notice that. Notice the right hand is thicker than the left hand here. And it can be difficult. You can get out of whack. You can cope it all out to fit into a leg, but really it needed to be this way coped out to fit. Now this is a trash piece, or at least, you know, if whatever mistake you made like that, you can have to use it somewhere else. So you need to get in the headspace and get rolling. So what I like to do is, is when I do this method too is to make my decisions on where straight end cut pieces are going to go and put them all in. I'll get him in, I'll get him in, I'll get a piece over there on that little short run with a straight cut end on both. That'll point my cope, cope from here away from me and I'll point my cope from here away from me which will be good but I'll get all those in there. I'll get this whole side done, this whole side done, run around that there. I got a scarf to do in here. To That's how you send them together is you back angle one and forward angle the other in a 45 and scarf to make a smooth section. But get that all up and out of your way. Now you're warmed up, you got the rig on, you got the tools rolling, you've been at it for an hour or two. Now you're ready to start coping and do a little tester like this or two or three. Get warmed up with that. But this is a nice way to do it because then you've been at it. It's not walking in cold to cope molding if you can help it. So there's a lot of great little things that you can do to increase the likelihood that you will be successful. And pre-paint, it's always easier to pre-paint crown. It's when you lay it on its back, all the sides face up. You can brush and follow through real smooth, make perfect brush strokes. And then you haven't got to crank your neck around and, and cut into the ceiling color and the wall color with your head crooked around and on the ladder, dicking all around with that. At most, you'll have a little touch up after the pin nails go in, but um, pre paint if you can. And this came with whatever this was, and it's really close to our trim color, so I'm calling it to save time and effort and just putting it up as is. I crack the windows out because when you're working in a space, it's always a couple degrees warmer in the top half where the heat rises. So if you've got a rig on and you're up and down a ladder and you're working, it's going to be uncomfortably warm and you start making mistakes if you're uncomfortable. So I preemptively crank the windows or crack them. But overall, these are the um, sort of things you want to get set up to your advantage. I need to have the vacuum set up to the saw because I'm indoors. I'd like to get a momentary contact pedal like Finnish Carpentry, the YouTube channel. I forget the exact name, but he's got a nice momentary contact switch, so when he's on it, the vacuum runs, and when he leaves with the piece, it shuts off. He's got a big jig for big, complicated profiles on his saw, which I didn't invest in because we're doing a little guy, and um, I'll just wait for another time. That'll work just fine. I took the uh, fence extensions off so I can cut to the left and the right with a 45 and not crash into those, and that with that, I can still stand him up. It, this profile I can still stand up in the box, in the miter box. If uh, it was taller, I would need a fence up higher and I need a cleat out here to support it at square and we're gonna fudge it to get through this. The other thing I'll mention is that I cut things a hair long uh, with the flat cut end and I'll nail it, nail it, and then sit the middle down and that'll, and nail it if it was a hair too long and it'll force pressure out to the ends and install that really nice and tight. That's cool. But that method is even better when you come with the coped piece. I put a little bit of caulk on both ends just to fill the crack and come out, come squeezing out rather than applying it afterward because the idea was that I had such a nice tight cope it would be hard to drill it in there. So I put a little bit on there, get the end in, nail it, get the end in over here, nail it, and he's bowling just a touch. But when I sit that down with nails, it just shoves those ends out against the nail pressure. It's, as long as I don't put more than one in to hold it, it'll shut that miter so incredibly tightly against the profile of the straight cut end and squeeze out any caulk and I'll just sweep that off uh, with my finger and that joint will just be just preloaded with tension to a tiny degree filled with filler if necessary struck off immediately and it's basically done uh, and for all intents and purposes will never show a shadow or open up or anything the way that a miter can with changes in humidity and stuff so these are all the things that I'm up to 
when I come to do this process and I recommend that uh, people take a stab at it, especially with a small profile painted um, with free material or secondhand. You can get good at this pretty quickly with some attention to details. So check it out when it's all done.